Hare Krishna. Why is that Bhakti Siddham says what he talked about says that? Pridaya Valila Keva Dayata Dasara Shiva Gopi Dhamna Kotar Kirtam. The Bhakti Siddham says what Thakur said that. Someone has said in my heart that the service of Dayata Das, namely Bhakti Siddham says what Thakur, is uh, Kirtan of Hari Kata, Gopi, Gopi Dan the Kata Kirtan. Gopi Dan means Krishna. So Krishna Kata is another kind of Kirtan. So we'll begin that now. So I said I'm going to speak Krishna Kata, but uh, there are many forms of Krishna Kata, and there's also, when we think of Krishna Kata, we often think that should be Gopi Lila. But Krishna Kata is very wide. The Krishna Kata also includes discussion of Upanishads, King Tad Brahma Kim Adhyatma, what are the, the abstruse topics of, what are the topics of the absolute truth. And all topics that are supportive to understanding the philosophy and practice of Krishna consciousness. So there's, it just so happened that here in my visit to Hyderabad, we, the verses of Bhagavatam are discussing some topics which um, I personally feel very strongly about and that uh, should be preached about is the social gender roles or just gender roles we can say because there's a lot of confusion about this all over the world at the present time um, I'm going to speak some more about this now there's a lot of confusion over gender roles how, sh how should men behave with women because all over the world at the present time there's propaganda or not only propaganda but legal enforcement of gender roles that are opposite to those of traditional societies all over the world. They're, they have arrogantly concluded that all the, uh, all the knowledge of the ancient traditions is all useless and we know much better. That everything in the past was wrong and we know much better and we have the proof that we have so many suicides and alcohols and crime and divorces and our society is much better. They're such fools and rascals to use Prabhupada's accurate language. It's not Prabhupada's, I mean Krishna also says many times you find in Gita, Murha uses this term. Um, but we are all living in this society and we tend to become affected by it. And even if we ourselves want to follow the social dicta that are for our ultimate benefit, it's often very difficult due to social pressure or our own family members don't want to, or even the law may forbid it. Just like... Uh, a hundred years ago in England, as in most countries of the world, it was illegal to engage in homosexual acts. Now, in England, it's illegal to speak, even to speak against homosexuality. So, times have changed. So, actually, Prabhupada's books, technically, they should be Ill illegal in many countries of the world, including India. Because in Prabhupada praises sati, that's illegal in India now. He, and he doesn't recommend that we, that's taken up, but he said it's in a, it's described in Srimad Bhagavatam. Arjhi, the wife of Prithu, followed him like that. And Prabhupada says this is the path for a chaste wife. He says that the, the fire of separation from him is more intolerable than the flames. And then it's many times it's read that the, the, the sati, they don't feel the heat of the flame. They, they, they don't feel any discomfort. 
Even now you see this, uh, the, the Tamil people, they do this Thai pusam. They, have you seen that, the Thai pusam? They put the, they put the big needle in their mouth and through their tongue and hooks in their back and pull a chariot and there's no blood, no pain, nothing. So, um, anyway, the general topic I wanted to speak on was uh, particularly for the youth because we find many youth in India today taking up Krishna consciousness, which is good. Youth, old people, young middle age, everyone should take up Krishna conscious. Many youths are uh, taking it up, uh, feeling that the modern way of life is not giving us the happiness that it promises. That you see in the advertisements, they say, drink Pepsi and then you're all, ah, I'm happy, but no one's happy. <laughs> you can drink hundreds of Pepsis and you won't make you even in the slightest bit more happy. And I like this, it's, it's, youth are much frustrated actually, I'm seeing. So frustration is a good springboard to take to Krishna consciousness. If one is pious, which people in India generally are. Uh, recently one, mag one devotee was telling me he read in a magazine that they interviewed many youths from the educated upper crust of society in the four metros and the general consensus among the young people is that actually we, we like the old Indian way of life better but we're caught up in the modern way of life and there's nothing we can do. Well there is. You can go to your Iskon temple. That's what you can do. Um, but this culture we live in is problematic and it can be difficult to be a devotee, one has to be determined, of course, if one understands how wonderful Krishna consciousness is, if one has any insight into this and how miserable and foolish and misdirected this modern way of life is, then certainly we'll be determined. But it can be difficult to, uh, due to social pressure, to take it up if we're in the college environment or whatever. And as one of my friends was relating to me, devotee, that it may be difficult for the devotees who have youth age children to convince their children to follow the same culture that they were brought up in because the modern youth think that well why don't we just do what everyone else is doing and even our people are becoming devotees but they still live they've got one foot on this side and one foot on the other side and it may be difficult to understand why we should follow all these different... You chant Hare Krishna, but everything else you can do also. So, so we may think some things are not so important. Just like, for instance, um, in the college culture, or lack of culture, they, it's uh, normal for boys and girls to mix up and laugh and joke. But that's not acceptable in human culture or Krishna conscious culture, because there's a reason for that. What is the reason? Well, you may think, well, well why don't, you know, all the, all the girls dress up in tight t-shirts and tight jeans and, you know, that's, what's, you know, it's, everyone does that, what's the harm? And you cut your hair and you have different hairstyles and what's this tying it up and not cutting it and, well, there's a reason why that traditional culture is there. Why shyness is considered, shyness and chastity are considered great qualities and why it was, it was considered wrong for young boys to talk to, even talk to young unmarried girls. It was considered, a, was considered in the past a, a insulting behavior to do so because you're, you're infringing their respectability. 
So why is that? You would say, what's the harm? You know, where, where you dress like this, you dress like that, what difference does it make? Or what, is, what harm is there if you have friends at college, boys and girls? Uh, what's the harm? Maybe you all want to move over this way a little bit, give, give our mothers a little space to sit. So the reason underlying all these restrictions, these, yeah, these are restrictions. And we may say, well, why so many restrictions? <laughs> We don't like restrictions. We want to be free. We want to do as we like. Why are our parents trying to restrict us? Of course, modern parents don't restrict, they encourage. But our those parents who are devotees, they may try to restrict their wards or their children. So the reason for this, there's a very good reason, which materialistic people won't accept or they'll have difficulty to accept that this attraction between male and female is very powerful, just in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Stating the obvious. But if not controlled, it can be a cause of great suffering like fire. Fire is powerful. If controlled, it can be something very useful. If not controlled, it's extremely dangerous. And that example is given in Bhagavad Gita by Lord Krishna. Dushparenanalena cha. That karma, lust, burns like fire. So, if that is controlled, in controlled means that lust should be channeled in the manner given by dharma in the dharma shastras. That means within respectable family life. Kama viruddho bhute shu kama usmi bharatarshava. Lord Krishna says that that uh, propensity of lust which is channeled according to the principles of dharma within family life for uh, producing good children, that karma, that is not degrading, that is a representation of Krishna. So that is very good, to, to bring forth saintly children, godly children. But unrestricted lust, or uncontrolled lust. It seems that if we just indulge in that, that will make us happy. We think, well, that's, that's what's wrong. We have this feeling, why don't we indulge in it? But the actual result is suffering, always. Unrestrained lust, always. It has, it seems as if it will be very good, but then we find out in the end, it's always a cause of suffering. That's why, it's another reason why traditionally in India, and actually not only in India, even in the West, marriages were arranged, it, not in the West, I know at least in, in Ireland where some part of my family is from, until recent times, the uh, Permission for marriage. You couldn't get married without permission from your parents. Was it like that in? It was like that in the Catholic countries, especially. Still in some parts of those countries, yeah. That they don't arrange it, but you have to get. They arrange also. In the villages, they still arrange. It's actually a very. It's better to arrange because the parents, in a dispassionate way, can see who's better, how they're suited, what like this. But out of lust, there are so many cases where th that just someone falls in love with someone who's completely unsuited to them. But the nature of lust is that you don't see that. You become blind. And then you suffer afterwards. I, I'm, I'm, I'm all the time hearing stories of people. Some young lady marries a man, and, but and she just... You know, how, how are you? Hello, how are you? Oh. 
I love you, let's get married. And then she has two children and then she's not laughing because he runs away, he never hears of him again and that's it. She's left holding the babies. I was told in one town there was a, a man from a rich family and his daughter was at the college and the, uh, there was a guy standing outside the college selling this, uh, what's that called, this aloo puri kind of thing? They, they, they sell like this. Huh? Del puri. <laughs> I never, I never bought it in my life. I've just seen the stalls. But, uh, so, he, he, so he used to laugh and joke with the young girls and one of them thought, oh, he's so nice. She was from a very rich family and she wanted to marry him. parents said, no way. But anyway, she ran away with him. And uh, he thought that after he was, he'd marry her and he'd get the money. But the father said, don't come in the door anymore. And so she was out on the street with him. I mean, he lived in the Chobopati. And then when he realized that he wasn't going to get any money from her, he said, you know, you not get out of him. You know, I don't need you. So she came running back to the father's house and said, no way, you know, forget it. You left me. And so she was completely finished. And even if the father accepted her back, then no, no respectable family would, you know, she'd get divorced and then, but no respectable family would take her. Life's completely spoiled just because of some stupid lust, because some, some low class person laughs and smiles at her. That is the nature of lust. She was intelligent, you could say. I mean, she's going to the college and this and that, but lust covers the intelligence. It never brings happiness. So, why should we follow these restrictions? Actually, it's for our own self-interest. And there's no question of spiritual advancement if we're increasing the fire of lust. That has to be controlled and brought under control. And also, it, it's... Uh, I mean, there are so many considerations. It's extremely, it's actually very low class behavior for, for men to, and, and girls to all just joke and laugh. And then it's actually, it's, even not considering the social, the, the spiritual point of view, it's just, it's just very low class. And, and another thing, I mean, there's so many considerations. You can never study properly if you're just thinking about the girls are thinking about the boys and the boys are thinking about the girls. They, they, they find the best schools, they found even in the West, they find the best schools are where they have, set, where they separate the boys and the girls. I mean, what does the, even the, uh, even those who are breeding animals, like if you're, you don't leave the bulls with the cows, right? The bulls become finished. They have no, they lose all their shakti. They have to be kept separate. So it's, uh, Separation. Separation means that uh, mixing under restricted circumstances also only. And in a manner that is conducive for our spiritual advancement. And uh, like I say, mixing up together. And this, is, this dressing in a way that the, the bodily features are emphasized. Like I say, it's extremely low class. It's just... I mean, if, just like this, if you, if you dress with all tight clothes to show off your body, what does that mean? That you're, you're saying, I want sex. You might as well have a t-shirt, come and grab me or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's practically saying like that, isn't it? That I, here, this is what I'm advertising. And your idea, it's demeaning to the personality. Is that all you have? It's only that's the whole sum total of your being that that you're just going to show off some body. So devotees shouldn't be sucked into this. It should be on a high level. If people ask, you can say that. Look, you know, I've got a higher ideal. People may laugh. Let them laugh. But uh, they're always laughing foolishly anyway. They laugh at anything and everything. And don't be a t don't be afraid. If, if such people laugh at you, you should be glad. 
That's why I think many people criticize me, but when I see the people who are criticizing me, I know I must be doing something right. <laughs> So you can take it as a compliment. <laughs> if fools laugh at you. Of course we shouldn't be proud and think I'm so much better, but actually there are certain principles of higher human life which it doesn't, re it doesn't require a very high level of spiritual advancement to understand. Like I was saying in the morning in the class, Prabhupada wanted his Western disciples to come to India to learn about cultured behavior from the non-devotees in India. Both devotees and non-devotees followed a culture that was so much better than in the West. The Prabhupada wanted, and, and I've personally learned so many things, not only from devotees, but among even from uh, Sahajya type devotees and Smartas and all classes of people in India who the, the culture is basically the same among all the, I mean of course like we're not talking here well even the Shaktas who, who kill animals I mean even there's some culture they have but basically we're t when we're talking about Vedic culture we're mainly talking about Brahminical culture because we'll find in the Shastra most of the directions are, are meant for the Brahmins and others for Kshatriyas and the, the Vedic literature is, is mostly for Brahmanas and to a lesser extent for Kshatriyas and they are the, they are the, they set the ideal for other classes in society. So we turn about Brahminical culture and I find even today there are, there are people who are upholding their Brahminical culture but I take it as my great fortune that, uh, I've traveled widely throughout India and, and lived in the houses of and met people who are actually very cultured. Even they may have a different philosophical understanding to that which we are propagating, but in their behavior, in the traditional behavior that's been handed down in their family for generations, they're behaving in a very civilized manner that we can all learn from. And as I was also saying this morning, that it's not just rules and regulations, the, the culture doesn't just run on rules and regulations. But there's a, in all these families you'll find there's a very strong religious element, whether it's Vaishnav or some other element. And also, this culture fosters great affection. It's not that the, the parents are telling, do this, don't do this, but it's, it's out of affection that the children will benefit. One, uh, I mentioned in that book, Glimpses of Traditional Indian Life, one Madhva Brahmin, I, we, he, I went to his village in the Udupi area, and they, they were all t together, they were doing some special puja and chanting mantras for hours, for hours and hours without seeing any books, and they were just, they knew so many mantras. Then afterwards we were talking, and he said, yeah, Actually, I was very naughty as a boy, but I'm, th I'm very thankful to my father because he beat me and he forced me to learn Vishnu Sahasranam. And I was very grateful. So his father was beating him, which nowadays they might take you to court for or something like that. <laughs> but uh, he was very grateful. Prabhupada also told the story of one man who was... He's lost his parents, he was brought up by his aunt, and his aunt just, out of a misplaced sense of affection, allowed him to do whatever he liked. And then he got into bad company when he got older, and he became a gunda and a murderer, and eventually he was sentenced to death. So he was, it was a public, it was to be a public hanging, so he was standing on the gallows about to be hung, Hung means, you know what that means? Fasi lagan. So he was about to <laughs> get uh, hung in public and said, any last wish? Yeah, he said, call up my aunt. She's standing there crying in the crowd. So he's tied up like this. So she came up and said, come close, I want to speak in you. So she put his knee next to his and he bit off her ear. Spat it out. 
So in the other ear he said, I did that because it's your fault I'm here today. You never taught me what is right and what is wrong. It's your fault that I'm here today. So this misplaced sense of compassion that you should just let your children do whatever they like and everyone should just do whatever they like, that means if you do whatever you like without training and what is right and what is wrong, then you'll just come to the animal platform, that's all. It's the parent's duty, it's the teacher's duty, it's the guru's duty to guide, to give proper guidance, say, this is right, this is not right, you should do like this, you shouldn't do like this. In the modern age, they think, well, you shouldn't give any personal instruction, you should just let people do what they like. But do what you like means you'll be like an animal. They say they're hypocrites, they're rascals. They say you should just let people choose what you like, but they force you to go to school and learn all nonsense, good Darwin's theory. And, uh, and if you don't have, let your children watch the TV in which they brainwash you to be a complete demon, then uh, they say, oh, well, you, well, you're depriving the children. Why don't you let them watch TV? So they say you should choose whatever you like, but they train you to be a demon number one. And then, and then uh, you say, well, you should let them have their own choice. So in the most hypocritical, exploitive, manipulative society, and our protest against this is that we don't want to be part of your society. Just like one time in America, Prabhupada, one newspaper reporter came to Prabhupada and he said, to Prabhupada, that don't you think that your disciples look very strange, the way they're dressed with these funny bed sheets and, <laughs> and shaved heads and funny ponytail? <laughs> and Prabhupada looked at him in the eyes and he said, My disciples are like diamonds in your stinking society. <laughs> the man got up and walked out. <laughs> he didn't like to hear. But actually, it's a fact. This is you. So, so you you, you live. A, don't live according to the standards of the people of, who don't know what is right and what is don't know what is wrong, and are going to hell. You dress as a live as a devotee. Dress as a devotee. People ask why. You can say this is my protest against your stinking society. You tell them. You say why? Why are you wearing tea like? You shouldn't wear. No, you should wear tea like. You can all go to your college, work, everything. Go with Tilak. There's only people, traditional people I see in South India. They wear something, this namam or this, different kinds of Tilak or at least a red dot. In different parts of India I see. So, previously in India, if you didn't wear any Tilak, that means you, you don't belong to that. You, you're, out, you're not a caste Hindu. You're not fit to have a guru. You don't, you're not fit to enter a temple. So that was considered very low class. Now if you have tilak, they think, what's wrong with you? <laughs> so be proud. Stand for your principles. Have some faith. Live according to Krishna's directions. Really, we have to understand that this, this modern society has got nothing to offer us except misery. Advertised as happiness. They have no idea what happiness is. It's just totally exploited. All they want you to do is work and work and work and they give you a, a few toys like a car and a, and a, and a <laughs> just like children they give you a few few toys to play with. So also they give when you get big instead of having a toy car you have a big car. <laughs> but there's nothing of any substance. They have they have no idea what is the purpose of life. They talk about love, we fell in love. They have no idea what love is. They have no idea of responsibility. They have no idea of who is Krishna. They have no idea that there is God and our duty is to serve Him. Totally misdirected, totally foolish. So, there is a reason. It's not that it's all the same. Whether, whether you dress in sari or salwar kameez or t-shirt, there is a difference or jeans, or dhoti, you can, now you're coming to the town, you're coming, I see many of you are here all day Sunday, you can also wear a dhoti, get used to it, someone can show you how to put it on, you don't know, no idea. 
born in India and no idea how to wear a dhoti. Would be, would be ashamed to be seen in a dhoti. But no, you can wear it, wear it with pride. One devotee in the West was telling me, because they used to think in the West when they first saw us in dhotis, they thought it's kind of strange, it looks like kind of female dress. <laughs> That's the Western idea. Although, of course, in in Arab countries and like that, they they, they still wear their gowns like that. They don't. The Arabs they don't have any sharam about wearing their clothing. They go all over the world dressed like that. So, uh, but one devotee was telling me, well, nowadays it's considered kind of prestigious to wear this kind of thing because they had so many kung fu movies. And and that's considered kind of macho. They think you must be a karate expert or something. Like that. So anyway, one that's the yeah. If any of our devotees are kung fu experts, that's also okay. We're not against it. I mean, we don't recommend that you do it. But if you already know, that can also be used in Krishna's service. <laughs> in the Western countries, it used to be uh, some of our temples are in very bad areas of the city. So, one of our devotees, he knew how to use this numchaka. You know what that numchaka is? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, he, he was still quite attached to that after joining. So, Every night, practically, he had some practice because we're <laughs> in a very bad area of London. I mean, it's all bad, but some areas are worse than others. So they're always like drunkards and rowdies, and still in London, it's horrible. I mean, the temple's wonderful, but right outside the door is hell, and at night it's worse. So all night long, you hear people screaming and breaking bottles and. Sometimes you go out in the morning to chant your japa after Mongolia and there's all blood all over the pavement and they have been fighting. Yeah, this is the this is the wonderful civilization that you are following. In Sydney I was there as long nineteen eighty nine. I didn't go there since then. We had our temple in downtown Sydney. And in the night we heard some shots and then in the morning we heard the don't go out to chant your rounds because the police have Cordoned off the area because there was a shootout last night and several people got killed because it's still like the... Anyway, I don't even want to tell what the shooting was about because it's so horrible. So don't follow this nasty civilization. It's really... It's not a joke. This, this, now we're laughing, but really it's not a joke. This, this civilization that you're following is one that just produces, it's so sinful, it's so much cause of suffering. And you're just beginning to get the beginning of that in India with all these people having so many psychological problems, so many suicides. About 10 years ago, I read in the paper that, that the, the number one state in India for suicides is AP. Or it may have changed by now because there's a lot of competition. <laughs> but... Uh, but uh, it's it's a horrible situation. Bangalore must be number one, yeah. <laughs> Is it number one city for suicides? I can imagine because Bangalore was well known as being a very traditional city and now it's just suddenly become the most so-called progressive, which means sinful. So uh, it's like the dichotomy between the two phases is, is you're just suddenly shifting the culture. You can imagine that people, you know, they want to, you know, people are doing all bad things, but in their mind they think, oh, this isn't good. And mostly, even today in India, people do so many, people are doing so many bad things, but in the back of their mind they're thinking there's something, something wrong here. So they actually, inside, they feel very uncomfortable. There are so many things that can be said. All this laughing, joking, I, the college students. Have you ever noticed how, they, how they're all laughing and joking? And, ah, ha, ha. Have you ever noticed how empty it is, the laughter? There's no pleasure in that laughter, is there? They're, they're making jokes and everyone is laughing, but there's no actual pleasure, right? No one's actually happy. 
They're laughing, but they're not happy. It's just laughing is just some kind of expression of their frustration, actually. So, and the friendship, it's all very shallow. There's no substance to it. Because the so-called friends, what friends? A friend means someone you can give your life for. That you, you, you're really helping each other to, to grow in life. But in modern student life, friend means just someone you can have fun with, that's all. Who tells lots of jokes and you go to parties together. But the, there's no depth or substance in the relationship. It's all very shallow and empty. And that's why you find so many students, they're all living together and they have so many friends, but they're lonely like anything. Externally, they appear to be very gregarious, but inside they feel empty because there's no friendship. There's no real relationship. And even themselves, the way they're acting, it's just, they, they feel, I'm, I'm just false. It's not real. There's nothing there. So in Krishna consciousness, it means to develop actual friendship can develop when we, when we have a solid principle on which it's based. The solid principle is that we're helping each other to advance in Krishna consciousness. We've got something very real here. It's, uh, friendship isn't just a matter of, well, we're coming together because somehow we're living close to each other or, or I, I like your hairstyle or something like this. <laughs> Ever notice that? That we say, I, I fall in love with you, I really love you. I lo but what do they fall in love with? It's only falling in love with the body. Why is it that all the young men fall in love with the beautiful women and not the less beautiful women? Is it, why is that? That's another thing with all this emphasis on sex and good looks. By the laws of nature, you'll find that maybe one or two percent people are very good looking. And then you get maybe another ten percent who are quite good looking. And then you get about seventy percent who are not very good looking and not very bad looking. And about, you know, twenty percent who are pretty ugly. That's the, that's the laws of nature. It's like that. So if you happen to be born with a pretty ugly body or you have lots of spots or you're black or your teeth are sticking out or something like that, and then people make fun of and or, or they don't or they neglect you and they judge you just, you know, how you, what you look like, which is extremely shallow. So it makes life miserable for those who buy buy Prarabdha karma or, or whatever it is, they they happen to have some bodily defect or some speech defect or whatever it may be. So, and then the, the, what happens is when everything is based on sex, then the, the beautiful girls, they just use the young boys, they just make them dancing dogs. They just look at them like this and then they go, ah, <laughs> the boy. So it's, it makes everything very, very superficial and cruel, actually. Very cruel. Like I say, someone who's a speech, they're stuttering or something. Or anything. They're, they're in student life, they're just everyone's attacking everyone else. That If you're not so good in your studies, they'll make fun of you. If you're if something not very good looking, they'll make fun of you. If you stutter a little bit, they'll make... Isn't it? So cruel. So nasty. So Krishna consciousness really means to, to come to a better standard of life. Where we, see, we actually see the person, spirit, soul, part and parcel of Krishna, come off the superficial platform. Well, cruel. So cruel to other people. Just looking for some opportunity to make fun of others. So, there are just a few thoughts. I'm supposed to shoot off to Secunderabad soon. And it's the inevitable question <laughs> from Krishna Chan, which is, we're not making fun of you. We congratulate you for having a lively mind in Krishna consciousness. What's your question? Well, uh, apart from the sex, I mean, I expected all the sex... <coughs> Oh, why you may say why I talk so much about it? Because practically, it's the it's the main current in modern life, especially in student life. It's like the the 
the overwhelming theme or, the, or what's on everyone's mind most of the time. Apart from that, uh, among the devotee youth community, hmm. one of the most uh, formidable type of uh, uh, attractions are, is, is, you know, I mean... Actually, now you said that, maybe I should just make this point more clear. You can go back to your question. Is that um, in devotee society also, although we have a high ideal, um, it is natural that when young men and young women come together, even for a higher ideal, there may be some uh, secondary feelings or mutual attraction that may be there. So, um, in our devotee society, we should be very careful not to promote this. There shouldn't be any scandals that young boy and young girl, they come to the temple and they run off in some love marriage, say, don't do that. that be, for one thing, that will not help your spiritual life, which is what we came here for. And also, you'll give the whole wrong tenor to a for our association. It, definitely, most, some devotees, they'll become brahmacharis, but uh, for women, it's always recommended they be married, and for most men also. So, that can be seen to in a, that can be looked into when you're more mature in Krishna consciousness, all these things. Marriage and this and that. But definitely, the, uh, even in Krishna consciousness, or even more so in Krishna consciousness, that we should be very respectful and reserved in our dealings and with, between the sexes, and practically it should tend towards zero. That the the men go in men's group and the women go in women's groups, and like this. As Prabhupada said, man is good and woman is good, but the combination is almost always bad. <laughs> unless it's unless combined properly according to religious principles the, in which the combination becomes very good but if it's not handled properly it becomes can become very destructive like I say in the example of fire so yeah you can go back and say all what's right. the other un undercurrent uh, thing is, uh, the, uh, all these things caste and we shouldn't uh, sometimes I say among devotees they say uh, or they're worried about caste or 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 he doesn't know English, so you know he's, oh, they are, they don't know English. They kind of look down on them. This kind of consideration shouldn't be there. Hmm. Well, it's actually like the ambition to pursue a very good career in the material. Ah, that's another thing. Yeah. So could you speak a little? Uh, could you elaborate on this? Because in spite of knowing so much, devotees are uh, almost helpless in trying to in trying to pursue those careers. They may even. No, I don't recommend being anxious after a good career because it takes up all your energy and time. We should rather be satisfied to do some kind of, have some kind of occupation in which we earn enough to live without taking up all our time and energy. If you have a career, then you have to study so much extra, work so hard. In general, I'm speaking. It may be in some cases just like one of my disciples was an accountant or something, and then he said, well, if I, if for two, he's just a young man, newly married, about that time must have been, what, 27 years old. So he said, well, if I study two hours extra a day for the next two years, then I can get a higher degree, and, if, and then doing the same amount of work throughout my life, I can earn much more money. So, but for two years, I won't be able to do so much preaching or any such... So I told him, go and do it. You, you have a family and you're going to... So, I, so it's... And actually he did. And he, he got uh, much... He's earning much more, actually, for doing the same amount of work. So, but... Um, generally, we should see what's most favorable for our Krishna consciousness. And generally, this idea of career orientation. It's also not very good for the character because... To, in most cases, developing your career means engaging in a lot of politics, isn't it? And treating people like stool and stabbing them in the back and all this kind of thing. So in general, uh, if we can settle for something which is uh, not so much in the 
We may not earn so much, but we earn enough to live. That we work to live rather than live to work. And we have time for Krishna consciousness. So sometimes they sort of say, well, if you're, if you have a high position and people respect you more and you, you can preach them more, but you won't, you won't, what will you preach if you yourself are living like a karmi? And you'll lose your taste also. So, the, like I said, this is a general statement I'm making, but it's, um, it, there may be, it may be also that someone has such a strong ambition and they just can't get it out of their system. So, you, you know, do what you like at your own risk kind of thing. Try and be Krishna conscious at the same time. We have to see, there are like a different circumstances. If, you, if your father owns a big business and if you can inherit it and go on with Krishna consciousness, then that's all. You know, it may be in different cases, like I said, different consideration. Generally, for Grihastas, I, I recommend that uh, if you if you can earn enough, then save and retire early. Why spend your whole life working? Then buy some property, or buy two houses and rent out one, something like this, and then uh, live in one, rent out one, and the, like this, something you can do. Just so some way you can have enough money to live, and then spend your time practicing and preaching Krishna consciousness. Each circumstance is different, but we have to see how we can live our lives in a manner that we don't have to get born again. That should be our consideration. Hmm. Then, that's your question. All right. What does following authority mean? That's a very... Well, that's what you could call a small question with a very big answer. <laughs> I recently gave a, a lecture on this, on this, just on this subject. That Prabhupada, if you see his instructions, he very, was very much emphasizing following authority, but he was also saying that uh, we want our devotees to be independently thoughtful. So I discussed in some detail what are the implications of these apparently contradictory instructions. So I'm not going to give that whole lecture now for one reason. I don't have time, but uh, we are recording all these lectures and that should be available after some time. So I'm trying to cover all these different subjects in these lectures. So if you want to get that lecture, you can ask, do you have Madhav's, you have Hare Krishna, right? You have Madhav's? email address. So it's one of the lectures I gave in Salem recently, and it's the title is there, actually. It's uh, On Following Authority and Independent Thinking, something like that. A specific, I thought that's an interesting subject, so I specifically addressed that. Yeah, like this is a small question. <laughs> Why is that uh, Krishna wants us to cultivate Krishna consciousness in us? Like, why is he made that Krishna consciousness as a basic instinct when we are made onto this world? Well, Krishna conscious means to serve Krishna with love. Yeah, that, that thing we are But love is right? something that has to come voluntarily. If you're forced, then it's not love. Right? So we have the independence. We can use it or misuse it. Please don't put that in your mouth. You should go and wash your hand and the pen, according to Prabhupada's instructions. Your mouth is meant for eating with nothing. Eating and talking. Don't don't chew unnecessarily. I personally saw Prabhupada instructed. A baby had his hand in the mouth and Prabhupada told the mother, take his hand out of his mouth, go and wash it and teach him not to put his hand in the mouth. He stopped the yagya. The yagya was going and said, this baby is contaminating the whole sacrifice. Take his hand out of his mouth, take him and wash his hand and teach him not to put his hand in his mouth. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Sorry, last uh, small thing. Uh, you have spoken a lot about Mataji's today. Yes, because... And about the uh, majority here are Prabhuji's. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> they, are, they are thinking that this is all for Mataji and we are just, uh, because uh, 
No, it's for both. It's an attitude. So, it's an attitude, isn't it? My simple request is that Krishna says that once we start contemplating some idea and gradually that develops and then ultimately the things fructify. And secondly, the type of environment we live, one time is the, we ourselves, we don't control our mind and senses and follow some certain do's and do nots which are prescribed by our authorities like you. There is a great chance and, and the danger starts from there actually mm -hmm. because the, you know, the boundaries are not there and the specific instructions are not there. And, uh, well, you got some specific instructions now. But at least we should be aware of this. I mean, you may think, well, we shouldn't talk so explicitly all these things, but if we if we're only talking in a very theoretical way, then how are we going to apply it practically in our lives? So, at least we should be. If we are aware, then we can begin to try. And there is. One thing is, Kali Yuga is very bad. That's why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave us the process of chanting Hare Krishna. So we have a good advantage also. You may say it's so bad, and it, but it's so bad, but it's so good also. Yes, it is very bad, and that's why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave us the easy process of chanting Hare Krishna. We have no other hope. So it's advantage and disadvantage. So take shelter of the holy name. But there are other principles which, if we follow, that will be helpful. So, we can try to follow them. Therefore, I am writing the books like that Brahmachari book and Glimpses of Traditional Indian Enlightenment is to give some idea of how we should behave. And many lady devotees have told me after reading that Brahmachari book they can understand better all these things. It's, it's to to understand the principles of civilized human behavior. There are so many points. It's, uh, sometimes it's misunderstood that, that we, you know, there's restrictions in mixing between men and women and men should look at, they should look down on women and no, that is very, if you, if, the, if you have this kind of attitude then well then then uh, that's already fallen. It's not by fanaticism that one can become Krishna conscious. One has to be very respectful. Brahmachari is always trying to to uh, address woman as mother. Also, Ramayan, Mahabharat. These are very useful for uh, understanding the, the cultural ethos of traditional Indian society, which is very good for spiritual advancement. What are the principles? These, from Ramayana and Mahabharata, we, uh, we can understand what is dharma. So these are important also. Okay. He said we should leave. We have to follow authority. <laughs> okay, we're going. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. It's been a very nice visit to Hyderabad after a long time. Seeing things developing here so much. We're very glad that uh, we have the problem of not enough space here. Made a big room and still there's not enough space. That's always a good problem. <laughs> Better than having a big temple with no devotees is to have an even bigger temple and still not enough space. <laughs> so we're very glad there's not enough, we have this problem of not enough space. You solve it, you make some more space and then make the problem again. <laughs> Make more and more centers. That will be good. So it's Anandam Buddhi Vardhanam. Increase the ocean of transcendental bliss by spreading Krishna consciousness. You have a great mission ahead. So please try to spread Krishna consciousness. Distribute Prabhupada's books. Now we have so many extra 
hands, legs and minds in Krishna consciousness. So, important duty of all of Prabhupada's followers is to give this knowledge to others by distributing these books. Right? He's the authority. So.